The PS3 was famously more expensive than the Xbox 360, and somehow, even more than 15 years later, that's still the case. You often find 360s selling for about $40 to $50, but for PS3s, you're looking at twice that, $80 to $100 at least. So when someone nearby was selling three PS3s for $50, how could I resist? Especially when they were all original design PS3s, which meant a non-zero chance that at least one of them could be a coveted backwards compatible model. Picking them up was interesting. I went to what I now understand is a dodgy neighborhood, and it was like movie levels of dodgy, like people screaming in the background, sirens, and I was just awkwardly standing there like, I am gonna get shot. They lured me here with cheap games just to kill me, I swear to god. But no, a man did come down with three PS3s. He only spoke Spanish, so I don't really know what he said. He could have been like, your videos suck, Matt, for all I know. But long story short, now I have these, and for the most part, they're in pretty decent condition. They're a little dusty, and the glossy surfaces are a little scratched. This one ironically was the least scratched because it used to be covered with a bunch of stickers. I've only left one because this was really hard to get off. You know the PS3 CPU was famously, or I guess I could say infamously, designed more like a supercomputer CPU than like a desktop computer CPU? That made the architecture challenging to write games for, but theoretically pretty powerful if you knew how to use it. The US Air Force clustered together nearly 2,000 of them to analyze satellite imagery, and the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth built their own cluster to perform astrophysical simulations of black holes. What I'm saying is, these babies can mine so much crypto. I'm kidding, obviously this hardware is obsolete and inefficient by today's standards, but I do kind of wonder what kinds of things people would be doing with them if Sony hadn't pulled the plug on running other OSs. But that's not important here. What is, is whether these even work. 50 divided by three is just under $17, so let's see what $17 can buy. But before we get into it, a message from our sponsor. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for creating a beautiful and professional looking website with no hassle. If you're looking to start a business, blog, online store, or really any kind of web presence, Squarespace is the easiest way to do it. They have hundreds of responsive templates to suit any need you may have, and you get a fantastic WYSIWYG editor that lets you do anything, no code required. But if you do like to code, you can also enter custom CSS and header code anywhere you want. I especially like running my online store on Squarespace because it means that all that delicate payment information is being handled by widely used and well-tested code, rather than something cobbled together by me at 2am. So if you're looking for a convenient and straightforward way to make a website, look no further than squarespace.com. They have a free trial that lets you check out all of their features, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash mattkc to save 10% off your first purchase. Okay, first up, let's try Sticker Boy. Seems good. Hey, here we go. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Oh, I'll have to get a controller. <laughs> Hang on. Fun fact, if you plug a PS4 controller into a PS3, it will work. It just can't be wireless, won't have vibration, and the PS button doesn't work. But other than that, Oh, nice. This is looking pretty good. <laughs> of course, what what else did I expect? But so far, it seems to be fully working. All right, we gotta try a disc. I might prefer modding and playing games off hard drives, but it is something we need to know. Well, look at that. It may say eat more acid on it, but this seems to be perfectly fine. Anyway, I call that $17 well spent. All right, next up. I don't know how to differentiate these, so I'm gonna call this one Billy. What do you got, Billy? Oh dear. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that on the camera, but it spat out a bunch of dirt and dust. Gross. It's, uh, oh no. Fuck. I just realized what that is. Well, what's come out the back of this PS3, uh, there's no other way of saying it, is bug remains. Oh, and the uh, light on the front is flashing. Red light of death indicates some sort of fairly fatal issue. Maybe if we go in and clean this out thoroughly, it could be all good. We'll see about this one. Ew, what is all this shit? Oh, don't tell me that's like bug feces. Jesus fucking Christ. All right, so that felt a little more like what I would expect out of a $17 PS3. 
How about lucky number three? If there's anything that Schoolhouse Rock taught me, it's that three is a magic number. Let's turn it on. Yes, there we go. Apparently this used to belong to a wow, sir. Wow, indeed. What did you used to play, wow, sir? Oh, nothing, apparently. What? This seems to be pretty good. Another $17 well spent. Let's try a disc. Well, that's not a good sign, but you know what? That is okay. Like I said, I'm the kind of person who likes modding and running games off hard drives anyway, so lack of disk functionality, not such a big deal for me. So honestly, I can't really complain. Two of these seem to work fine, minus the one disk drive, and I'm definitely gonna try fixing the third one and see if we can get three working systems, but even if I can't, $17 for a parts machine is still a pretty good deal. Sadly, if you were wondering, none of them have PS2 compatibility. It was a long shot anyway. There were very few models that ever had that, so it's not exactly surprising. Okay, so all of these need a good clean, that's a given. But what is inside this one? The one that didn't work? I have to know why bugs were spitting out the back, and I have to know if it is actually fixable, because the only thing better than two PS3s is three PS3s. So I went ahead disassembling. As disgusting as I felt doing it, I knew that every single bit of this needed cleaning and the only way to do that would be to take all of it apart. What do you think you're doing there, little man? Plus, I was somewhat morbidly curious just how bad it would get. Oh, fucking hell. This is getting to me. I'm like, ah. As you can see, there's some pretty severe corrosion in a lot of places. If that managed to eat through a component or trace on the board, that could very well be our culprit. If it's a corrosion issue, it's probably fixable. Uh, the bad news is it's going to take a lot of willpower to get there. Okay, let's get to work. I feel like Gordon Ramsay in Kitchen Nightmares right now. It just keeps getting worse. I've eaten here! Is how the uh, bug legs got spat out uh, when we were trying earlier. Some of them just happened to fall into the fan. Before diving into the cleaning, I found a theory online that a red flashing light could be caused by a power supply fault. I thought I'd better open it up and see if the cockroaches got in there too. There were some bodies that had worked their way in, but actually, for the most part, it was just dusty, not infested. So these plastic bits- oh, fuck me, I just touched this furry shit in the back, it's just dust, but... God damn, I hated doing that. While looking at it didn't tell me much, I realized there was another way to confirm if there was something wrong with the power supply. I mean, I just happened to have two other PS3s with known working power supplies that I can swap in and see what happens. Or so I thought. Uh, so apparently this plug in the front is different between the two power supplies. Uh, that's cool. So assuming the power supply was an unlikely culprit anyway, I decided to just leave it and move on. I also figured I should check inside the Blu-ray drive too. Once again, I don't consider the drive super important, but it would still be good to know. And from a glance, it also seems pretty much fine inside, though obviously we won't know for sure until I can actually turn it on for more than two seconds. There's also a disc in it. N C double A basketball. Another game for the collection, I guess. With that, it was time to look at the board itself. But first, this thing really needs a clean. Like, desperately. Okay, so everything has been cleaned. Most of the bug carcasses are gone, but there's still areas that need a lot more care and attention. So I cleaned these areas off with a lot of alcohol, as well as some isopropyl alcohol for the board, and then went ahead reflowing any joints I could see that looked corroded. I also figured while I was here, I may as well replace the thermal paste too. Honestly, I was very much stabbing in the dark, just hoping something here was the problem and would be fixed by the reflowing. Unfortunately, after doing this for hours pretty much all over the board, nothing had made any difference. After a while, I was starting to feel a little lost and unsure of what to do next. I thought, if only the PS3 had some way of reporting error codes. 
Hey, wait a minute. The PS3 is a very complex device, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Thankfully, it's also a very intelligent device, and it constantly monitors its state for errors, especially during startup. The PS3 system controller, or syscon, logs these errors, and this log can be accessed externally with a simple serial connection. If we hook into that, maybe we can figure out exactly what's going on. Now there are some complexities to this, each board revision puts these points in different places and also reports the error codes in slightly different ways, but eventually I figured out where the points were and started getting error codes. If you look at the output here, the left column are the actual error codes, while the right column is the time that the error occurred at. The time is all Fs here because I removed the clock battery. As far as the error codes go, there's a lot of info about these on PS Dev Wiki. For our purposes, we can ignore the A and 0 at the start. The next two digits represent the startup step that the error occurred on, ranging from 0 to hex 80. Since these all say 80, that means the PS3 actually passed its power on self test and started booting before the error occurred. The next four digits are the actual error, and we seem to be alternating semi-randomly between 2, 1002, and 2124. 1002 represents a power failure in the PS3's GPU, also known as the RSX. Specifically, it indicates noisy voltage on the RSX's power line caused by bad filtering. That's definitely useful information. 2124 is less well understood, but appears to be a general error in the console's AV or HDMI encoder chip. So what does that tell us? They both seem to be graphics related, but what does that actually mean? To be honest, I was a little worried about the HDMI encoder error because it's a surface mount chip with a lot of tiny, delicate pins. If it had to be replaced like PS Dev Wiki suggests, I honestly didn't even know if I'd be able to do that with the equipment and expertise I had available. However, I also realized that the much clearer Aero 1002 did have a much more obvious culprit. There are a set of high performance capacitors that are a big part of the power filtering and supply for the CPU and GPU. They've become known as the NEC tokens for obvious reasons, and they've become kind of the Xbox clock capacitor of the PS3. Not in the sense that they start leaking and corroding the board, thank god, but that they're starting to fail en masse, becoming one of the most common issues with PS3s today. PS Dev Wiki even says that while many components are involved in filtering and could cause 1002, that it very much points to the NEC tokens. I had a sneaking suspicion that the HDMI encoder error was actually a red herring, or at least a symptom rather than a cause of some kind of greater power issue. With this, and knowing it's a common fault anyway, I decided to dive straight into replacing the NEC tokens. While you can't buy exactly these things as a replacement, you can buy a number of surface mount tantalum capacitors that achieve the same result. And so finally, I have some replacements. It's like a rainmaker. Now, this is not cheap. Each capacitor costs between one to two dollars and you need four of them to replace each NEC token. That means to replace all eight NEC tokens on the board, you need to buy 32 of them. So all in all, that ends up being about 50 bucks. And as we all know, you could buy three PS3s with that. I come from the school of older electronics where if you're replacing capacitors you may as well replace them all, but it's actually recommended to keep at least some of the originals in place for reasons that'll become clear later on. But not knowing that yet, I carried on removing them all, which in and of itself is a bit of a challenge. They're soldered on the bottom, which means the usual tricks like solder braid or desoldering guns won't work here. At first, I tried a heat gun to try getting the solder hot enough that it would just come off smoothly, but I'm still not super experienced with stuff like this and I couldn't really seem to get anywhere. The PS3 board is very thick and infamous for being able to quickly dissipate heat. Eventually the capacitor started coming apart so I just picked away at it, which is actually one of the recommended ways of removing these things. Yeah, as we learned from the Wii's capacitors, often the easiest ways to remove surface mount components is by destroying them, paradoxically causing less harm to the pads as well. In this vein, I later took another recommendation of using a razor to slice them off. While I was initially skeptical, this actually did end up being the cleanest and most effective way to remove these, at least for me. What we're left with is four pads per capacitor. The two on the outside are positive and the two on the inside are ground. As I said earlier, we'll be placing four new tantalum capacitors on each one, but there's a slight complication. The new caps are actually too long to fit snugly between these strips, which means you either need to scrape away at the board to expose more of the pads so you can mount them vertically, or just mount them diagonally, which is what I opted to do. It took a bit, but all capacitors have now been replaced. I think I did everything correctly. Pushing the power button.
so it's a little bit less functional. <laughs> Not only had this not fixed the PS3, it was actually shutting off much sooner than it was before, indicating an even more severe fault. I redid them all, hoping I'd just made a mistake somewhere in the soldering, but it didn't make a difference. As it turns out, I had made a mistake, but actually not in the soldering. This is the first reason why you may want to keep at least some of the original NEC tokens. Turns out they contain an internal bridge between the two outer positive strips connecting them in parallel, and this is necessary for proper functionality. So if you keep some of them on the board, that bridge remains intact, but if you replace them all, as I have here, you need to replicate that bridge yourself with some wire. It's staying on! <laughs> oh, hell yeah. So we officially have confirmation that despite all the cockroach bodies and feces packed into this thing, the only actual issue affecting functionality was a very common fault with the NEC token capacitors. Except another issue started to rear its ugly head. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hang on, hang on. I turned it off. Since it had never been on for that long before, I'd gotten into the habit of not bothering to install the heatsink clamps, meaning after about a minute on, the CPU was starting to overheat. So I'll just reinstall the heatsink clamps, right? Well, here's reason number two why you might want to keep at least some of the original NEC tokens. These tantalum caps aren't just long, they're also significantly thicker than the original caps. Specifically, the CPU caps. The GPU caps actually do fit fine because the GPU doesn't require quite as much capacitance. That means this top shield no longer sits flush on the board because the new caps are trying to poke through it. No matter, I'll just cut some holes into the top case. Now we can install the clamps and we're all good, right? Well, no. Naturally, this isn't just an issue with the top shell, it's also an issue for the bottom shell, where the board actually makes contact with the heatsinks. You can even see from how the new heatsink grease was spread, or more specifically how it wasn't, that the CPU definitely isn't making good contact with the heatsink. This was unfortunate because the bottom shell is a lot thicker. Regardless, I went ahead cutting more holes to make more space for the new capacitors, only to find that even that didn't really help. Turns out, the CPU heatsink actually overlaps a significant amount of the capacitors, and the new caps are so thick they're just slightly taller than the CPU itself, basically ensuring that the CPU doesn't make good contact. While I might have been able to cut holes into the shielding, the heatsink is another story entirely. I don't know if I could cut into this thick metal even if I wanted to, so I had to think of something else to do. I thought, well, if they're only slightly too high, maybe if I cleaned up my solder job and got them as flushed at the board as possible, and as far away from the CPU as possible, maybe that would fix it? But sadly, it didn't. They were still tall enough to interfere with the cooling. I was stuck here for a while. It seemed like there was just no good way to solve this problem. At this point, I really was wishing that I had kept the original CPU caps on the bottom, especially since the CPU didn't seem to even be the problem, or the errors were GPU related. And it's not like I could restore the old caps because obviously they were destroyed by the removal process. I kept thinking about it and really I just needed the caps to be somewhere else, preferably as far away from the heatsink and shielding as possible. And that's when I got an idea that was pretty radical. There was this kind of empty space to the top left of the caps, which was not only out of the heatsink's way, but also completely cleared the bottom shield. Could I somehow move the caps up there? With no other ideas I could think of, I decided it was worth a shot. I soldered the new caps in a row on some cut-up bits of paperclip, and then soldered the paperclips to the pads, almost like a railway track. I had no idea if this would work, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Well, it did. The PS3 still booted and functioned properly, but with the added bonus of no longer overheating after like one or two minutes. After all that work and investigation, after cleaning hundreds of hollowed out bug carcasses out of this PS3, it finally seemed to be working properly. For the most part. While the thermals had obviously improved to the point it could now play games for long sessions at a time, it did still seem to run a little hotter than I'd expect. After only 10 minutes idling on the XMB, it seemed to reach as high as 69 nice, degrees Celsius, and during gameplay it was getting dangerously close to 80. This all felt a little too high to me, but I looked at some online statistics and while these are obviously completely anecdotal, it does seem to suggest that some board revisions do idle that hot. 
I don't think this is caused by my mod anymore, but I also didn't want to just leave it running that hot all the time. I thought I'd try one last trick to help get the temperatures down. No, not delitting. I don't think I have the courage for that just yet. This is called the eraser mod. Essentially, you just stick some heat resistant and non-electricity conducting substance, like a plastic eraser, under the CPU clamp and it adds just a little bit more pressure, increasing the CPU's contact with the heatsink just that little bit more. And don't worry, it's not going to be as thick as it looks. The clamps will squish it down so that it provides even coverage. There are concerns that adding more pressure to the board could be bad for it, but I feel like it should be pretty safe because it's only adding a fraction of a millimetre to a system already designed around clamps and pressure. Was that enough to make a substantial difference? Amazingly, yeah. My temperatures across the board dropped by about 10 degrees Celsius. And thanks to Webman's Auto 2 fan speed algorithm, the CPU temperature doesn't even exceed 65 degrees Celsius, even during gameplay, let alone idling. I think we can officially call this PS3 fixed. Pulled back from the brink of death, ready to put that supercomputer CPU to good use. Playing video games. Sadly, it looks like I won't even have the time in this video to clean up the other two PS3s, but since those were working and just needed a good dusting, I'm sure you guys already know what that would look like. So I really did get three PS3s for $50, plus the exorbitant replacement caps of course, but still, all things considered, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. It was definitely a tough project, but those are always the most rewarding. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye, guys.